Verse number 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, and I must decrease. He that cometh from, a, from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. John said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. John was from the earth, and he's earthy. But he that came from heaven is above all, is above you and I, my friends. And so I started this uh, sermon. This will be the second sermon. This will be the final sermon. Jesus must increase. Amen. Dear Jesus, please help me, Lord, as I preach. But Lord, every heart, Lord, may we be prepared to receive the word that's given. Lord, people, Lord, that are here gathered this afternoon, may this be something that's helpful and edifying. Lord, if there's something that uh, convicts someone's heart, Lord, may they not uh, be angry at me, but Lord, may they just look to you and confirm it to be true and, and submit if it is, Lord. And if there is some truth to it, Lord, I pray that you would help us to receive it in the love uh, that it is, I'm trying to give it in. And Lord, I do pray that you would just please uh, bless all of us for the reading and the teaching of your word today uh, as we receive it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We talked about the fact that Christ is preeminent and how he had a preeminent place. Uh, that John, The book of John really does a good job at showing right off the bat in John 1 that Jesus is God, that he created the worlds, and that he came to the world and it came to his own, but his own received him not. But he just basically gave the gift of salvation to every man who would receive him. They could have eternal life. Uh, that is the message of the book of John in a nutshell. What a beautiful message it is. But as we uh, read the writings, the, the, the story of John the Baptist, we find this message that was resonating loudly and clearly uh, that Jesus Christ is all that he claimed to be when he came and he said that I am from above and that I am the one, uh, you know, I am up in heaven now. He's proving his deity and his omniscience and omnipresence, I should say. Uh, all of it's true. John said he's the one that came from heaven. He's sent from heaven. He is the one that I came to uh, to to tell everybody about. I'm the one. I came for that purpose to magnify him. Don't worry about me. I must decrease. My ministry must decrease so that people can see more of Jesus. And so when they came to John after this, they came to hear about Jesus. And Jesus, of course, was the message. So the, in the book, uh, in John, we found out that he's presented as the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. He's presented as the Savior, the atonement for the sins of the whole world. He's so, shown to be the one who, the only one who can give eternal life. And he's shown as the bridegroom and the one who is above all and the one who created the worlds, the world and all that are uh, the all around. We talked about John the Baptist. He was a remarkable man. Of course, you know, people certainly could look to him and lift him up, but he said, I must decrease. I mean, people could lift him up and say, well, this man was born uh, with a miraculous birth. Uh, people could lift him up and say, this man was filled with the Holy Spirit from a baby. You know, uh, we, they could lift him up for that. But he said, I must decrease. When anybody sees anything about us, and they see, uh, well, that preacher's a great preacher. That Christian's a great Christian. That that soldier's a great soldier. That person's a great person. That businessman's a great businessman. We must say, like John, it's not me. It's the Lord. Yeah, I must decrease and give him the glory and the praise and the honor. I must he. I must decrease and he must increase. John responded correctly and did not get prideful. He didn't take the credit. He didn't say, you know, well, don't follow him. Follow me. You know, he didn't wasn't just doing it for himself to get the power and people to look to him and everything. The Bible says in Colossians chapter one, we ended with this, that in all things, he being Christ might have the preeminence. We need to give Christ the preeminence in our life. We need to let the Lord be number one. Uh, the man Diotrephes in third John basically would try to steal the, the glory from God. He was personally uh, threatened 
by pe other people uh, that might, you know, take the limelight from him. When John would come around, he wouldn't have the preeminence anymore. People would all come and he want to hear him. But you know what? We're all, you know, some people get this way in the church, right? Some people say, well, that person's getting more praise or that person's getting more of this or, or uh, you know, that person uh, is seen as, as higher or lower or whatever. But our attitude is that Christ is superior and we're all just humble servants. Yeah. I'm not better than anybody here. And you're not better than anybody here at this church. We're just servants of the Lord. Uh, I must decrease and Christ must increase. If we have that attitude towards each other and towards the Lord, guess what we're going to do? We're not going to have the same. We're not going to have fightings and problems and stuff. We need to decrease uh, and, and be humble and willing to take offense just like the Lord took offense. So we, um, we, we certainly wouldn't want to just you know, hold somebody off and not receive them. Because, oh, it might offend us or we might not be the, in the limelight anymore. Now, preachers do this all the time, by the way. They'll, they'll you know, be embarrassed around some better preacher. They, they wouldn't want to have some preacher that would make them look better or, what, or worse. You know, there's, this person's smarter and they feel intimidated about them. People do that in all kinds of fields. Um, they'll have somebody that's, you know, making more money, has a bigger net worth. And uh, they just, people will despise them in business just because they have more money and uh, they, they feel like, well, they're insecure about it. And they want, they, they, they're, they, they want people to look at them. So they wouldn't want to be compared to that person. But in the, in the ministry, it's all about Christ in the, in the church. It's all about Christ in your life as a Christian. It's all about Christ. Uh, we need to learn how to decrease. That's what the second sermon's about. And I want to just give you a few thoughts here this afternoon. Christians point number one will either be filled with ourself, or we're going to be filled with Christ. Christ will be on the throne. It's going to be King self, or it's going to be King Jesus in our lives. When we read the New Testament, we see that there are two kinds of Christians spoken there. We find, you know, we find that there are two kinds of Christians that are given. There's a carnal Christian there. And by the way, Paul Washer is this guy that says there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Well, then if that's the case, then why does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. And his false teaching is, is that you're not really saved if you're not victorious in your Christian life. If you're in sin, you're not saved. That's what this guy says. You know, you need to truly be saved so you can stop sinning. Well, that's that's a lie. We all are going to sin until the day we die. We should, hopefully it'll do it less and overcome some of the, the crazy or foolish things we've done. But uh, the fact is, he says, he tells them in this church in 1 Corinthians that they could not, he said, I cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even unto as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither are, yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? While, and for while one saith, I'm a Paul, and another say, I'm I'm of Apollos, are ye not carnal? You see, in this particular group here, we've got a group of people that are basically pridefully lifting themselves up and saying, you know, I'm better than you because I was saved under Paul and I follow Paul. And someone else says, no, I, I'm better than you because I'm under Paulus, and I think Paulus is better. And, you know, is this not the same thing that we see today in some independent Baptist churches? When somebody says, well, my favorite Internet preacher is so-and-so, you know, and I'm better than you. I'm better than that group over independent Baptist churches over there. I'm better than that person because I was, I was led by this person or that person. He says, you are carnal, carnal. There are people that are there are people who are carnal and there are people who are spiritual. Romans chapter seven. You want to turn over there. We have two types of people. We have the conquerors and the conquered. Right now, we know that we're more than conquerors in the sense that we can't be separated from the love of God. But when it comes to the Christian life, there's a lot of Christians who are defeated. It's not because they don't have the, the sword of the spirit. It's not because they don't have the, the armor that God gives them, but they have to put it on. You have to put the armor on or you're not going to, do you think you're going to be able to, you know, deal with the fiery darts of the devil if you don't pick up the shield? 
You know, like you say, well, I'm in the military and I, I got all this armor. Well, what good's it going to do if, if you're in the battle and you don't put on the, you know, the, the sappy plates and the, all the stuff that they got there, the, the helmet and all that. You got to put it on. The Bible says in Romans 7, verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that, that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, that which that I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And I, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You know, like you say in your heart, I love God's law in my inward man. But then I end up over here breaking what God said to do and stuff. And he said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this sin and death? Notice this. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So within the, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. My friends, we don't have to just be conquered all the time, though. The Bible gives us a way that we can conquer our flesh and, and live uh, in the spirit. And uh, we don't have to be conquered all the time. Like we, we don't have to be conquered. And God gives us the Holy Spirit and he helps us to do that. Uh, those who are, the Bible also, there are Christians uh, who also, two types of Christians, who uh, one type of Christian is what the Bible calls, turn over to 2 Timothy 2, a vessel of honor and a vessel of dishonor. Some people wreck and ruin their life and uh, limit God's, you know, power and usage of them in their life. You say, what do, what do you mean? I thought with God, all things are possible. Well, you know, there is... Um, you know, qualifications to be a pastor. I mean, I've met people that, that felt that God would call, had called them to preach, but they went out and they got, you know, into, into major sin that disqualified them to be a pastor. Now, there are some that just go on. I mean, you got married and divorced people like uh, Peter Ruckman got married and divorced how many times and remarried and divorced and remarried and re divorced. And he just said, well, it's under the blood. Or he said, oh, that, that woman probably wasn't even saved, so I'm, I'm free to go. I'm good to go. That's a lie. That's all that stuff is, is junk. Uh, there is this common misconception out there that, that people, uh, that if, if you were married before you were saved, because they'll say, well, you know, if you were married in the Lord, you know, uh, in the Lord, it says, oh, in the Lord, then, then, you know, that's binding. But if you were married, if you were married before you got saved, then that doesn't count. You know, so you, you're free to get remarried. It's crazy. You know, you still made a covenant and a bond. And I think the Lord still sees that as uh, I, I mean, I could disprove that in so many ways. But a lot of times it comes up if somebody's been married and uh, divorced, then they'll come to the pastor and say, uh, oh, I got saved. I have a living wife, but I'm divorced. Can I get married to a Christian girl in the church? Bible says the answer is no. You know. The Bible says a husband of one wife and having faithful children. And you got single pastors and divorced and remarried pastors. You know, you can limit it. Not to say you can't be used to God. God will use anybody. God will use any of us. I mean, even, even if you're nothing but a bad example, right? God can use you. You can give your testimony and say, hey, kids, don't do this. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Listen, every day you live, there are opportunities to serve the Lord. And those opportunities, if yielded to, and you're yielding to the Lord, living a clean life, and you're taking those opportunities, those will lead to other opportunities, which lead to bigger opportunities and better things. But that's why I say that many times people limit, you know, God's work in their life because they're they're not a vessel unto honor, and uh, they're not there. It's like if you want to be used by God, it, it, when he talks about a vessel, he's talking about. Uh, you know, like a, a bowl in your cupboard, right? Or a cup or something. And uh, you've got one that's on the dirty side of the sink 
And it's got several days. It's got like some nasty macaroni and cheese and back bacteria growing in there. Something turning green on it. Uh, which one are you going to go to? Are you going to go to the one that's clean and sparkling and crystal and, and clear and everything? Or are you going to go get that one when it comes time to use someone? God's going for that clean vessel. He doesn't necessarily need, look, he doesn't need the flashiest vessel. He doesn't need the most expensive vessel. He doesn't, he's not going in there and like, oh, let me get the silver one or the gold one or the, you know, some expensive, some exotic stone or something like that. No, he just wants one that's clean. Amen. One he can use. And my friends, uh, there are those vessels to honor and those to dishonor. There are those who walk worldly. And those who would walk worthily. The Bible says in Colossians 1.10 that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There are those who walk in the spirit and then there are those who walk in the flesh. I'm just talking about what it means to decrease. Okay? Because, you know, I'm talking about letting God use us. I'm, I'm talking about being ready for God to use us. The Bible says in Galatians 5.16, this I say then, Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible says in Galatians 5:25, if you we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. In other words, those who are living lives of selfishness or self, where self is increasing, and there are those who are living life where Christ is increasing. And where where are we at in that? Is Christ increasing in our life? Are we putting him first in our decisions more and more and more? considering his will and his his desires for us. And the cool thing is, is that God's desires are always the best for us. We may not see it. Our flesh definitely doesn't see it, but we're like children when our parents tell us we can't have another bowl of ice cream, right? God knows what's good for us. Say, oh, I can't do this anymore. That's because, you know, God knows it's not good for you. Number two, John the Baptist here, I believe his words show us and his attitude shows us what God's purpose is for every Christian. In our lives, Jesus is supposed to increase. We're supposed to decrease. When Christ saves us, he comes into our lives and we become a Christian. And there's, there's a lot there for us. And, you know, we have, a, we have work to do, you know. I was talking to a brother and um, I was, we were talking about soul winning methods and this guy really didn't know a whole lot, but I was telling him, he's like, cause he'd been hearing these people on the internet putting works before salvation. But I told him, I said, don't ever do that. Don't ever sit there and talk about, Oh, you know, God, you have to, you, not, you know, if you get saved, you, you know, or if you want to get saved, this, this, and this, you know, God has a plan and a purpose and he wants you. I said, just, that's great, but you, you don't want to confuse them on works. Right. Don't make them think that's part of it. What you want to do, though, is afterwards say, hey, you know, God would like you to come to church. He'd like you to get baptized. He'd like you to. Read. By the way, God wrote a book and it's got just incredible knowledge and wealth of knowledge and information in there for you. It'll change your life. And God wants you to read it. He's got great things for you. And so we put that on the other side when we, once we get saved. He wants to come in. You know, he wants to fill our life and, and to increase in that life until basically he's guiding every step we take. I'm not saying I've attained, but that's what he's wanting to do. And it's his rightful place. He's not just, you know, because we talk about Christ coming into our life and our, into our heart, but he's not there just to be a resident. He's there to be the president. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He's the king. He's not there just to be pro he, prominent, but he is to be preeminent. He should increase. We should we should go down. We should de uh, in uh, uh, decrease. Basically, the law of displacement, right? You see, you know, we could say, "Hey, we're separating." You know, we're separate as Baptists. We're separating from the world, but what are we separating to? You see, it's not about just running from the world because, oh, it's so scary. All that worldly stuff will mess you up. No, it's like I'm running to Christ. 
I'm reading my Bible, and all of a sudden, that stuff is repulsive. It's wicked. It doesn't have, I mean, I'm getting over here with Christ, and I'm all of a sudden, it's like, oh, man, I don't like that junk because Christ hates that stuff. Amen. Don't start with the stuff. Start with Jesus. Get to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Start loving his word so much and replacing it, and all of a sudden, that stuff is just like, you know, junk food, cheap Nasty stuff, you know. Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of God Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness, with all fu the fullness of God. With all the fullness of God, yeah. Colossians 3.17, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our, of our faith. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Sing it with me. More, more about Jesus more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will discern, Spirit of God my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming, Prince of Peace. Tell me more about Jesus. We need more of Jesus in our life. John the Baptist's word describes the struggle that every Christian has, number three. Every Christian has this struggle. You know, John's people were following him. It's like, wait a minute, we're following you. We're your disciples, John. And he's like, wait a minute, I never said I was the Messiah. I never said I was the one. I'm here preaching. I mean, I'm glad you guys came out to hear me in the wilderness. But I'm just a preacher of, of Jesus. The self is ugly. The self is sinful. And we just need to decrease. We need to let God change our life. This is not the world's philosophy. If you go to therapy, you go to a psychologist, this is not what they're going to tell you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it would solve a lot of mental illness and solve a lot of conflicts and a lot of problems if people would just come to Christ and let Christ be formed in them and let, let the Lord uh, change their thinking and their behavior, Amen. it would change their life. It's actually very healthy. This is the heaven's philosophy that God has set up, that old sinful self should be right out of the picture and that Christ would fill us. There's a, a neat hymn. I don't know how to sing it, but it's called, Oh, the Bitter Shame and Sorrow. I'm going to read it to you. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly answered, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me. I beheld him bleeding on the cursed tree, heard him pray, forgive them, Father, and my wistful heart said faintly, huh, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong, and ah, so patient, brought me lower when I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Higher than the deepest heaven, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last hath conquered Grant me now my supplication, none of self and all of thee. Another hymn puts it this way. My Savior, thou hast offered rest. Oh, give it then to me, the rest of ceasing from myself to find my all in thee. Famous missionary William Carey, had, when he was dying, he turned to a friend and uh, he said this. When I'm gone... Don't talk about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's Savior. That's the, our attitude. That should be our attitude. 
The Apostle Paul possessed the same desire. You know, when you th read the Apostle Paul, we think of him as the greatest, right? We think of him as like the, the apostle that did probably more than any other apostle to get the gospel out. I mean, that's how we lead. But isn't that interesting? Because you see the Apostle Paul's estimation, if you asked him, what did he say? He said, no, I'm the least of the apostles. You see, Jesus taught that, didn't he? The, the greatest in the kingdom of, of heaven is the least, right? The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Paul, if you ask Paul, did he say, I'm the greatest? No, he said, uh, le I'm less than the least of all the saint, all the saints. Ephesians 3.8. And later, you know what he call, called himself? He said, I'm the chief of sinners. Never forget what God pulled you out of and the sins that you've committed in your life that you've had forgiven. Never forget that. That'll, that'll humble us. That'll keep him in his rightful place. Just two quick points real quick. Number four, the Lord only can increase in our life as we decrease, right? There's not enough room, right? No man can serve two masters. Either we love the one and hate the other, right? You cannot serve God and mammon. Choose you this day whom he will serve. How long halt you between two opinions? Notice the word increase and decrease. That's their words, words of degree. He must wax and I must wane. He must grow greater and I must grow less. It's, it's displacement. It's displacement. Think about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a, a cup that's you know full of yourself. Well, what has, what has to happen for the Holy Spirit to take over? You have to empty yourself out of there. If the cup's filled with you, you know, where's he going to go? But if you're filled with Christ and things of Christ, that's when the Spirit is filling you and you're being led by the Spirit. Well, how can I decrease so that Christ can increase? How can I do that? How can the self be conquered? How can, how can I let God have control of my life? Well, here's the answer, I think. Is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You look in that mirror and you tell yourself you're going to do right and da-da-da-da-da. And, and it's all in the power of your flesh. Is it? Is that it? Nope. We cannot win a spiritual battle with the arm of the flesh. Self cannot be dealt with with yourself, right? You can't do it. You need to, you need power that's from above. Let me give you two secrets. Open secrets, obviously. Well, we must die to ourself. We must die. We must reckon ourselves dead. In Galatians 2, turn to Romans 6 and in Galatians 2. I'm going to give you Galatians 2. You don't have to turn to that one. But the Bible says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. We're to reckon ourselves dead. We're to look at ourselves as crucified with Christ. Because think about it. He died in your place. He took your punishment. He died on the cross so you don't have to go to hell. So what do we have to do for that? What do we have? What should we do with that gift? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what do we do? We live in the flesh, but we live a crucified life where we say, I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to let Christ live in me. Christ lives in you. Let him be seen in you. Let him live in you. It's not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. The now if I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Make that a statement in your home and in your life and in, in our church. Romans 6, 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm dead. Christ, without Christ, I'm dead. I'm done. And so you know what? I'm going to live for Christ. 
I'm going to let the life I have now count for Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. I love how he says this. You see, you, ha- you can allow sin to reign or you can allow Christ to reign. You can allow self to reign and you can allow your fleshly desires to reign or you can allow Christ to reign. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Yield. Yield. Say, I'm not in charge, God. You're in charge. Take control. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go where you want me to go. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to see what you want me to see. I'm going to listen to what you want me to listen to. I'm going to say what you want me to say. The Bible goes on to say, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Number one, we must die to ourselves. Paul said, I die daily. And I believe we need to die to ourselves and say, you know what? Not my will, but thine be done. You know, Jesus himself asked that the cup would be taken from him. The cup of his suffering and the cup of the wrath of God that was about to be poured out upon him. Not just the physical suffering of the cross that he was bruised for our transgressions, but the spiritual suffering of the eternal Son of God being separated from God the Father, the, 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 the pain and the suffering of the sins of the whole world being placed upon him. The least we can do is be a living sacrifice unto the Lord. The funny thing about a living sacrifice is you just, you know, you can get up off the altar anytime you want to. <laughs> We need to place ourselves willingly on the altar and sacrifice our life, our will, our desires to the cause of Christ, to Christ himself. And number two, if Christ is going to increase and we are going to decrease, we must depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to do this. It is the Holy Spirit of God who forms Christ in the believer and who allows us to be free from sin and from self. The Holy Spirit enables and empowers us to serve Him and overcome sin. Romans 8, 2 says, or 8, 5, it says, For they that are the, after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's one of the most powerful verses for a Christian in the Christian life. Walk in the Spirit. And those fleshly desires are not going to defeat you. You're going to give, you're going to do what Christ wants, and you're not going to do what you want. But you have to walk in the Spirit. You have to reckon yourself dead. We must die to ourselves to allow Christ to replace, to take his rightful place in our life. He is the, the number one. He deserves to be preeminent in our life. Hopefully this has been a blessing and a help to you this afternoon and this morning. But uh, let's let's try to make Christ increase. Let's allow him to increase in our life. Uh, let's do the best we can. Dear God, please help us in this. Help me, Lord. People talk about, you know, being so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. But Lord, uh, we're supposed to be more heavenly minded. Most of the time, people are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. And so, Lord, help us to be heavenly minded. Help us to be thinking about the things of Christ and your will and your way and what your, your desire is. Praying about decisions in our life, making decisions based upon your word. And upon your your desires, seeking clear scriptures to live by, seeking principles, seek, seeking, uh, Lord, to please you in all we do. Lord, please increase in our church, among our members. May you be magnified every Sunday at this church to your rightful place. We love you so much. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.